<laughs> Welcome back to Nevermore Hollows. As you know, I'm Lafayette Faust. Tonight, I'm going to do something that uh, goes against my better judgment. I'm going to tell you a little something about myself. I try to keep my past a secret. Um, there are only three people who really know anything about me other than the fact that I am the historian here in Nevermore Hollows. I try to keep my past a secret. And you may ask why, and I'll just reply by saying it's probably safer that you don't know more about me. However, I will tell you this. I'm a musician, I play guitar, and I'm a bit of a historian of the genre of music called the blues. Now, it shouldn't seem strange for anyone who knows anything about the blues that I'm so steeped in blues lore. That's because the blues was birthed one dark night in 1929 when Robert Johnson, a poor sharecropper and aspiring musician, sold his soul to the devil on a dark crossroads for the ability to play guitar. Considering the blues and Nevermore Hollows both have such dark beginnings, it would seem that they are bound together with paranormal chains. This leads me to tonight's story which is about the guitar Robert Johnson took from the devil's hands that night after making his deal. Not surprisingly, that guitar showed up in Nevermore Hollows recently. So now that you are prepared for what's to come, I ask that you sit back, turn on a light, because this story is one of the darkest ones yet. Benjamin James walked across the yard toward the massive Victorian-style house. He had hoped to get to the estate sale before everything was picked over, but he had gotten stuck in traffic. At least a dozen cars were lined down the street, and when he stepped into the foyer, he could see that most of the good stuff was either gone or had sticky notes declaring sold. A curvy brunette with a glaring smile walked up and introduced herself. I'm Megan. I'm coordinating the estate sale for the family. I'm sorry to say that much of the better pieces are gone, but you can still look around if you'd like. You never know what might grab your attention. Benjamin thanked her and took the colorful flyer she handed him, which explained a little about the man who had owned the house. He had been Lyman Ledbetter, and he had died eight days ago at the ripe old age of 103. He had founded a small but successful recording studio in 1943 when he was 25 years old. His was one of the first studios to record black musicians and had by all accounts been honest in his dealings with the artists. It was widely accepted that his tiny studio played a major role in the introduction of blues to the world. This was the sole reason that Benjamin had been so excited about this estate sale. Benjamin was a musician and a collector of all things blues. Not only was he a pretty good guitar player, if he did say so himself, but he was also in the process of writing a book on the musicians that founded the genre. It was a damn shame that the great blues players were all but forgotten. He wanted to do his part in keeping them alive in spirit, so to speak, and to hopefully make them relevant again. He hoped to find something in Lyman Ledbetter's mansion that would inspire his creativity and maybe even be a small piece of the blues history. He wandered from room to room looking at the picked over items. He found nothing of relevance until he wandered up the stairs and found himself in a brightly lit room that overlooked a wide garden that was resplendent with what seemed like every wild flower imaginable. A padded stool stood by the window and against the wall, within reach, was a battered acoustic guitar. The guitar was missing small chunks in various places, and it had so many scratches around the edges of the sound hole that it looked as if it had been strummed by some clawed beast. The tuning pegs were chipped and dirty, the headstock had ancient cigarette burns, and the fretboard was worn smooth in places from thousands of hours of play. Benjamin immediately knew that he looked at something extremely valuable and historically important. He walked over to the stool and sat down. Please be Estella. 
Oh, please be a Stella, he said as he leaned over the guitar to get a closer look at the headstock. He could barely make out the faint script, which was covered in grime. He rubbed a finger over the letters, and his heart began to race as the dirt wiped away, revealing the brand name of the guitar. Stella. Oh, my gosh, he said aloud, then quickly glanced over his shoulder to make sure he was still alone. I have found a Stella. Stella guitars were made from 1899 to 1939. They were important because it was rumored that the man who started the blues, Robert Johnson, had played a Stella. In fact, the actual myth concerning Robert Johnson stated that he had met the devil one night at a crossroads in Mississippi and sold his soul so that he could become a famous musician. It was rumored that the devil himself had actually played Robert Johnson's Stella. Benjamin's hand trembled with excitement. He picked the guitar up, prepared to tune it and have a strum. But when he sat it in his lap, the guitar shuddered as if it were alive. Benjamin's eyes shot wide and he nearly dropped it. He sat stock still, wondering if it had in fact shuddered or if it had been due to his own excitement and shaking hands. After a long moment, he decided that it was just his excitement and imagination that had given the sensation. He strummed an E minor chord and was surprised to hear that the guitar was in perfect tune and sounded deep, smooth, soulful. He picked a few notes and realized that the guitar felt as if it were an actual extension of his hands. His fingers played across the fretboard as if the instrument had been made specifically for him. He finished the tune and rubbed his hands along the curves and back of the guitar, looking for any major damage. As he did so, his mind wondered about the places and the events this guitar had witnessed. Mojo, he whispered. This thing has so much mojo. He was startled when Megan said from the doorway, I wish I had someone to touch me like that. Benjamin gave an embarrassed smile. I like old guitars, he said. Just trying to make sure there isn't any structural damage considering it's so beaten up. Megan's eyes sparkled in the afternoon sunlight that poured through the large window. Her smile turned mischievous and she strode with a cat-like strut into the room. I heard you playing, she said and gave him a look that was one part appreciative and two parts a come on. You're a musician? Uh, yes, uh, I've been playing guitar since I was a teenager. It sounded as if you played with confidence, she said, taking another cat-like step toward him. I'm just curious if that's all you do confidently. Benjamin wasn't an unattractive man, but he was not used to such overt gestures from women. Instead of being flattered, he felt awkward, off-center, even a little fuzzy-headed. Um, I, I don't know, he stammered. I'd have to ask my girlfriend. Megan playfully tilted her head. Benjamin was reminded of a cat he had had once as a kid. He had named the cat Miyuki the Destroyer because she was a potent killer of all kinds of small animals who lived around his home. Miyuki the Destroyer would tilt her head just like that when she was about to pounce on an unsuspecting bird. Oh my, don't tell me you're taken, Megan purred. I was kind of hoping we could have dinner. Benjamin gave a nervous laugh. I, uh, uh, I'm flattered, but I think I'd better not. I appreciate the offer, though. Um, I think I want to buy this guitar, but I don't see a price tag on it. How much? Megan continued to prowl closer until she was only a foot away, looking down on him as he sat on the stool. He looked up into her eyes and noted that they were the same shade of green as Miyuki the Destroyer's had been. She looked down on him and pushed her lips together into a sensual pout. 
Her lipstick was an alluring crimson on her dangerous lips. I think we could arrange a fair trade. Benjamin tore his eyes from hers and shook the fuzziness from his brain. He stood and took an awkward step back. Um, I'm willing to pay a, a, a fair price. I have cash on me. Megan's pout morphed back into a seductive smile. Well, you can't blame me for trying. Look, every single person who has been in here today has just wanted to find an antique that they could sit in their house for decoration. You're here as a lover of music, and you can actually play the guitar. I knew Lyman well, and I think he would like you, had you two had met. Benjamin didn't know what to say when she paused, so he stood silent, forcing himself to focus and trying not to look too deeply into Megan's hypnotic green eyes or ample cleavage. Megan nibbled on her lower lip as she considered a price. Are you in a band? Do you play live anywhere? Benjamin nodded. Not in a band right now, but um, I do play live quite often. Just me and my guitar as a singer-songwriter. I have a couple of gigs around the town where I play while people mingle. Megan gave a decisive sigh. <sighs> okay, here's the deal. I'll sell you that guitar for $13, but I get invited to your next gig. Benjamin was stunned. If Megan did in fact know Lyman well, she had to know that this guitar was worth a lot more than $13. And if there was any way that this guitar could be tracked back to being owned by any of the old blues musicians, it could possibly be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. While he wanted this guitar, in fact felt a pang of intense desire welling up in him for it, he was an honest man. I can't pay you $13 for this guitar. It's worth more than that. Megan nodded. I know it is. And the fact that you know the importance of this guitar means that you deserve it. The fools who have been here today didn't give it a second glance because of how beat up it is. None of them knew its monetary or historical value. Besides, if you're as steeped in the blues as it seems, you know that a blues man doesn't choose the guitar. The guitar chooses him. For the first time, Benjamin realized that Megan was more than just an estate sale facilitator. He had not believed her when she said she knew Lyman well, but now, considering what she had just said, she clearly knew the guitar was valuable and that she had a knowledge of blues lore. His mind was still fuzzy around the edges. It took a couple of heartbeats to realize that the guitar had once again shuddered in his hands. He looked down, confused, not sure if he had really felt the movement. See... Megan said. It has chosen you. So pony up the $13 and you can be on your way. Her purring tone fondled his mind. As if in a dream, he leaned the guitar against the wall and counted out 13 $1 bills and handed them to Megan. Why $13? he heard himself ask. She seductively loosened two buttons on her blouse, revealing even more cleavage, and slid the cash into her bra, which Benjamin noticed was silky black. Thirteen dollars is how much Robert Johnson paid the devil for that guitar. Thirteen dollars and his soul. Benjamin couldn't recall the next thirty minutes, no matter how hard he tried. The last thing he remembered of the transaction with Megan was her claim that Robert Johnson had bought the guitar from the devil himself. Thirty minutes later, he seemed to wake from a trance. He was sitting in his car, parked in his driveway. His mind was clear, refreshed. He glanced in the rearview mirror and saw that the Stella guitar was laying in the back seat. Then he noticed a framed picture lying in the passenger seat beside him, with a pink sticky note attached. The message on the note said, 
proof of authenticity. Megan. He picked up the frame and his breath caught in his chest. There were only two photos of Robert Johnson in existence. In both, he was holding a guitar that was loaned to him by whomever had taken the pictures. It was widely agreed on that neither of these guitars in those two photos were his personal guitar. The stories that had been passed down over the past century all stated that he had toured the country playing Estella. The black and white picture in this frame showed a young Robert Johnson sitting on a stool in some smoky juke joint, a floor full of dancing people. He was holding a Stella guitar. And the photo was of such good quality that Benjamin could see the cigarette burns on the headstock and the claw marks around the sound hole of the guitar. They matched exactly the cigarette burns and the claw marks on the guitar in his back seat. Benjamin was not only in possession of one of only three pictures of Robert Johnson, but also clearly in possession of the man's actual guitar. Benjamin now owned the guitar that birthed the blues and jazz and ultimately rock and roll. Holy crap, he said. I have Robert Johnson's guitar, and it's literally worth a fortune. He grabbed the framed photo and gingerly got the guitar out of the back seat and took them inside his craftsman-style house that he had so lovingly restored to its former glory. Once inside, he went into the room he had set up as a recording studio and set the guitar on a small desk he often used to work on his other instruments. He turned on a lamp and positioned the light directly over the guitar so that he could clearly inspect every inch. He was giddy as he ran his hand over the fretboard and the top of the guitar. He was one of those musicians that liked to think that old instruments had stories to tell. And this one clearly did. It was scarred with dings and scrapes. The dark brown sunburst paint was riddled with tiny cracks. The fretboard and lower bout of the body was worn from use. The wear on this guitar is from the man who created the blues he said aloud, as he was accustomed to do when he worked on his instruments. He lovingly wiped the dust from the guitar with a soft cloth and changed the strings. Then, he sat at his recording station, fired up the software, and hit the record button. He strummed an open E chord and the guitar replied with a clear, mellow tone that filled the room. He smiled wide, his pulse throbbing, his mind reeling, and he launched into Dust My Broom, one of Robert Johnson's hits. After what seemed like only a few minutes, he reached out and stopped recording. He glanced at his phone and saw that nearly 90 minutes had passed. Due to the transcendent nature of music, all musicians are prone to losing time while they play, but he couldn't remember anything that had happened during the last hour and a half. He held the guitar close, leaned over his computer, and clicked the play button. He was in complete happy shock at what he heard. He was a solid player, but the recording revealed a level of playing that was much more sophisticated, more finely nuanced than he had ever been able to accomplish. That's me? He said, holding up the guitar and smiling in appreciation. I guess you've inspired something in me that I didn't realize I had. He sat and listened to the whole 90-minute recording. He heard himself play Dust My Broom, Sweet Home Chicago, Traveling Riverside Blues, and he shook his head in disbelief. Man, I can't believe that is me. All the songs that had been captured on the recording were of Johnson's more upbeat tunes. However, as Benjamin listened with a smile and thankful appreciation of the inspired playing that he heard, the last song began with the soulful riff of Hellhound on My Trail. He noticed the opening riff was slower than the original recording, and his singing was low and mournful. Benjamin sat back in his chair, still cuddling the guitar as he listened. Well, that doesn't even sound like me. He heard himself sing the dark lyrics, And the days keep on worrying me, There's a hellhound on my trail. 
hellhound on my trail. As he listened to himself sing those lyrics, he realized that it sounded as if someone else was singing softly in the background. He leaned closer, straining to listen. Yes, it seemed there was another voice, almost a whisper singing mournful harmony to his somber lead. He turned the volume up but couldn't hear any more clearly. He tried to isolate and amplify the other voice but was unsuccessful. After 15 minutes of trying various tweaks, he became frustrated and decided he needed a break. He gingerly set the guitar on a stand and made his way to the kitchen and made a strong cup of coffee. He took a sip, pondering the voice on the recording, and decided that maybe it was just a slight echo of his own voice. While his home studio was nice, it wasn't exactly pro quality, and the room had only a couple small sound dampening panels. It was possible that the other voice was in fact just an echo. And anyway, why should he care? The song was amazing. It was so full of emotion, and his playing was so passionate. He decided that it didn't really matter, and his smile returned at the thought that he owned a piece of important music history. He went back to his studio, grabbed the guitar, and brought it back into the living room, which was a wash in golden afternoon sun. He sat the guitar on a chair and sat across from it on the couch. Benjamin decided to look up the expected value of the guitar on his phone. There was no way to tell, really, because no one really believed that this guitar existed. But if it did, he knew it would sell at a record auction. He began his search and found an article from a few years back where one of the guitars that Robert Johnson was photographed holding went up for auction for six million dollars. He looked over at the guitar sitting in the chair and said, and that wasn't even Robert's real guitar. It was just a loner for the picture. This thing is priceless. As he considered his windfall, he heard someone step up onto the porch. He stood just as the door swung open and Ramona, his girlfriend, stepped inside. A worried look darkened her face, which was normally a wash in a radiant smile. Ben, are you okay? He gave her a confused look. Yes, I'm great. Why? What are you doing here? Ramona returned his confused look with one of her own. We were supposed to meet for a late lunch. You never showed, and you didn't respond to any of my texts or calls. Oh, wow, he replied. I am so sorry, honey. I bought a new guitar, and I think it may be extremely valuable. I got home and started playing, and I guess I just got lost in the moment. But I checked my phone a few minutes ago... I didn't see any messages from you. Ramona shook her head. Her dark curls bounced softly against her shoulders. You and your guitars, she said, a knowing smile playing across her full lips. How is it I always have to compete with old bits of wooden string? Benjamin was glad to see her smile at his forgetfulness. Her question was one she had asked on more than one occasion when he was lost in the moment with one of his guitars. He referred to these moments as finding the mojo. She knew that music was his passion and that he geeked out on guitars. She also knew that he went out of his way to be a great partner, consistently romantic, and lavishing her with attention, except for those moments when he was lost in the mojo. So she showed him grace with her forgiveness. His smile became sheepish. Your beauty and your company could never be overshadowed by bits of wooden string. Mm-hmm, she replied. You seriously didn't see my messages? I'm telling you, there weren't any. He grabbed his phone from the table and was surprised to see that there were, in fact, several text messages and one voicemail from her. That's odd, he said. I swear that I checked a few minutes ago, and these weren't here. Ramona stepped closer and wrapped her arms around his neck. The mojo on this new guitar must be strong. He gave her a quick kiss and turned to the guitar sitting in the chair. There's nothing new about this guitar, he said, his excitement evident. It's nearly a hundred years old, and I honestly believe it belonged to Robert Johnson. If it is his guitar, it's worth millions. 
Ramona was a singer-songwriter who was also trying to carve out a professional career. She had met Benjamin on a recording gig a year ago where he was hired to play the guitar parts and she was hired to sing some backing vocals. They had hit it off and had been together ever since. While her musical tastes were more country than blues, she knew enough about Robert Johnson to understand Benjamin's excitement. The Robert Johnson? You have his guitar? Benjamin's eyes sparkled. Yes, I believe I do. And that's it? she asked, pointing to the guitar sitting in the chair. Yes, he said, and snatched it up. As he did, he had the curious thought. This guitar was sitting in direct sunlight, but yet seemed as if it were in shadow. What's wrong? Ramona asked, seeing the look on his face. Um, nothing, he replied, and offered the guitar to her. Ramona was also a guitar player. She often used an acoustic when performing. She took the guitar and gave it a strum. Mellifluous tones rang, vibrating through the sunlit room. Benjamin felt a pang of jealousy wash through him. Why in the world did I just feel that? Wow, she said and plucked another chord. I did not expect this beat-up old thing to sound like that. He nodded. You know what that is, right? She smiled at his prompt. Mojo? Damn right it's Mojo, he said, and it's worth a fortune. I'm going to record a few songs on it, then I'm going to auction it off. Ramona gave him a curious look. Really? You'll sell it? It's not like you're needing the money. You do well. I would have thought you'd keep an important piece of history like this. I considered it, he said. But if I were to sell it, and it pay out what I think it will, I could sell my business and pursue music full-time with no worries about paying the bills. I see your point, Ramona said. Well then, since you're about to be newly rich, what do you say you take me out someplace expensive and we celebrate? Benjamin took the guitar from her and gingerly laid it on the couch. Sounds like a great plan. After an early supper, they spent a few hours at a club listening to one of their friend's bands. At ten o'clock, they returned to his home, had a glass of wine, and she sang a few songs while he accompanied her on the old guitar. They both felt a special something in the session that caused them to give each other appreciative glances throughout the performance. After finishing a song, Ramona had a wide smile. Did you feel that? Your playing was inspired, and it pushed me to reach deep down and find a little something special. Mojo, he said. This guitar has it, and we tapped into it just then. Ramona's smile became playful. Why don't we take some of that mojo to the bedroom? Oh, I think we can do that, he replied, and sat the guitar on a stand. He chased her down the hall and into the bedroom. Later that night, Ben lay in bed wide awake, thinking about the guitar. It sat on a stand in his studio. He wanted to get up, go to it, play it. He glanced over at Ramona, her back to him, deep asleep. He thought about getting up and playing, but decided against it. Ramona had her own place, but sometimes stayed over. It was just after midnight, and he didn't want to wake her, so he rolled closer to her, closed his eyes, and tried to clear his mind and fall asleep. A haunting tune began to whisper in his mind, bringing with it the tingle of inspiration. I can't play right now, he thought. I'll wake her if I do. That thought brought with it a small barb of anger. I have this moment of inspiration. I don't want to lose it. If she hadn't stayed over, I could be there in the studio, he thought. He tried to ignore the tune, but it wove a melancholy melody, beckoning him to get up come to the studio, pick up the guitar, and play. He rolled onto his back and tried deep breathing. The tune moaned through his mind, pleading with him to let it out into the world. He sat up, frustrated. He again glanced over at Ramona, the woman he had loved for nearly a year and with whom he had not once been angry, and realized he was in fact mad that she was keeping him from playing the guitar. I feel so much mojo at the moment, and I can't do anything about it. 
The tune continued to softly whisper its melody with its subtle urgency. He felt his pulse quicken ever so slightly. Then, realizing he would not be able to sleep if he didn't do something, he eased out of bed and quietly stepped out of the bedroom. He pulled the door softly shut behind him and made his way to the studio. The house had only a single nightlight casting its faint glow down the hallway. He stepped into the darkened studio and looked at the guitar. It sat on the stand in front of the window. A shaft of pale moonlight shone through, creating a luminescent glow that shimmered around the guitar. The scene was strangely dreamlike, as if painted by the hands of a surrealist artist. It seemed as if he were in an alternate reality populated by dark souls who lived in dark houses and who played dark guitars with moonlit halos. Benjamin smiled, wishing he'd brought his phone so he could take a picture. He thought of going back to the bedroom to get it, but the haunting melody swelled ever so slightly into his mind, pleading with him to sit, to pick up the guitar, to play. He shut the door and took a seat in a chair beside the window. This dreamlike scene so inspired him, fit so perfectly with the melody caressing his mind, that he did not turn on the light in fear of losing the inspiration that was the essence of this mojo. Guitar players were often accused of bonding with their instruments in a more profound way than musicians who played other instruments such as pianos or drums or horns. If you asked a guitar player why this should be the case, the vast majority of them would say that it was because when you play a guitar, you hold it close to your body, feeling the vibrations, merging instrument and instrumentalist into one creative entity. When Benjamin held the guitar close, ready to softly work out the melody in his head, the guitar was warm and he could swear that it pressed against him as if it were not just an inanimate object of wood and string. The feeling was akin to a loved pet pressing into a cuddle. When he quietly plucked at the strings, he got the strange sense that the guitar urged him into choosing the correct codes. In fact, it seemed as if the melody came not from him, but from the guitar. After playing through once, he pulled a mic in front of him and hit record on his computer and played through it again. As he worked through the notes, his inspiration grew, and within 30 minutes he had a complete arrangement with rhythm and melody. The only thing that had not come to him were the words that would actually sit atop the melody. He closed his eyes as he played, and the melody wove together a tapestry of longing and dreadful fear of having once had hope that was now forever lost. He finished the tune and realized that he was emotionally spent and physically weak, as if he had just cut open a vein and allowed his soul to bleed out. What is that song? Ramona said, standing in the doorway. At the sound of her voice, he jerked in surprise. He had not heard her come down the hallway or open the door. She stood there in the glow of the moonlight, wearing only a t-shirt, and instead of feeling this spark of desire, he felt the flame of anger. How long have you been there? He snapped. Ramona gave a confused tilt to her head. I just now opened the door, and I'm not sure why you're angry with me. Benjamin considered what he was feeling in the moment. He realized he was angry because he felt guilt at sneaking out of bed and into the studio to play the guitar. It was difficult to express his exact emotion, but it was akin to shame, as if he had been caught doing something forbidden. I'm sorry, babe, he said. I was trying not to wake you, and I was so lost in the moment that I didn't hear you come in, and it surprised me. Ramona considered his response, and her frown turned into a playful smile. I'll forgive you, she said, but if it happens again, you may have to find another singer who is willing to stay over after singing a few songs with you. Benjamin couldn't help himself and returned her smile. Don't kid yourself, he said. Singers who are willing to stay over after a gig are a dime a dozen. 
Ramona's smile widened. That's a hurtful statement. So does that mean that you don't want an encore performance? She turned and pranced down the hallway back into the bedroom. Benjamin stood, and completely forgetting about the guitar, he followed. He woke at 9 a.m. as the golden rays of the morning sun washed the room in light. He rolled over and was confused to see that Ramona was gone. It was Saturday, and there was no reason for her to be up and out so early. He showered and made coffee and ate a bagel. Then he stepped into his studio, wanting to listen to the recording he'd made. He grabbed the guitar and sat in front of his computer. He pulled up his recording software and clicked play. What he heard shocked him. He was playing that morose melody over a Delta blues chord progression, but he also heard lyrics being faintly sung. What? He said aloud. I couldn't find the words last night. That's not me singing. He turned the music up and could just make out someone singing, as if their voice was echoing from a room down the hall. It was a voice scraped raw by grief. Who is that? He strained, trying to discern the words and if it was a man or a woman singing. He could not make out the words, but decided it was a man. The voice was familiar, but he couldn't place it because it seemed too far away. As this thought struck him, he realized that it sounded as if it came from much further away than down the hall. He had the idea that it came from another dimension, one full of regret. He listened to the song until it ended. He stood and walked through the house, checking all the rooms to make sure that someone had not snuck in while he had been playing. He found nothing amiss. He decided to take a walk and try to understand how someone could have been singing as he played. So he put on his running shoes and stepped out into a morning filled with golden sunshine and blissful bird song. He lived on one of Nevermore's more nostalgic streets. It was filled with craftsman-style homes and was lined with sidewalks that were shaded by sprawling live oaks and the occasional palm tree. He could smell the briny breeze blow in from the sea, which lay only a couple of miles to the east. As he walked, he considered various ideas about who was singing. After a while, he settled on the idea that maybe someone had been on a midnight walk and had heard his playing and had been inspired to sing some impromptu lyrics. This was the idea that made the most sense to him. He looked up and found himself in Lovecraft Park, which was near the center of town. It was a sprawling park filled with sidewalks that wound through the groves of trees and colorful flower gardens. At its center was a curious fountain in the shape of a creature resembling a misshapen octopus with too many arms. He sat on a bench beside the fountain and took in the scene. Water splashed from the strange fountain and honeybees danced on the flowers and butterflies flitted around the heads of the other folks enjoying the park. But he found no peace, because the song clawed at the edges of his mind like a man trying to escape a coffin. The beauty around him was carved from his vision by the sharp edge of anxiety. I know that song. What is it? It's just on the fringes of my mind. Why does it make me so on edge? He pushed himself up from the bench and set off toward the park's exit. He hoped to walk off the edge and clear his mind. Maybe then the song would clarify itself so that the lyrics would present themselves. He felt that if he could just get the lyrics, he would understand why the melody made him feel so anxious. His stomach rumbled. He looked at his phone and saw that it was past noon. He was shocked that he had been walking for nearly two hours. He took a left after walking through the wrought iron gates and walked two blocks to Main Street, intending to grab lunch at Dante Inferno's pizzeria. However, as he passed Misfit's coffee, he glanced through the window and saw Ramona sitting with another man. He was fit and attractive, wearing jeans and work boots and a ball cap. He said something that made her laugh. She reached out and touched his right hand. He placed his left hand over hers, his smile wide, confident. 
Jealousy uncoiled itself from deep within Benjamin and struck at his heart. He watched as she allowed the man's touch. She used her free hand to brush a strand of hair from her face. Her smile was bright and her eyes twinkled. The man gave his own smile through a three days growth of beard that instead of looking scruffy, only made him look ruggedly handsome. He looked just like the pop country musicians who were impossibly good looking, who put on the costume of a good old country boy, though they had never once in their lives stepped foot on a farm. As he watched this interaction, he was finally able to recall the song that had been just beyond his mental reach. It was 3220 Blues by Robert Johnson, and was about a man who finds that his woman is cheating on him. The lyrics crawled out of his mind like a cluster of poisonous black spiders. So that's where she's been today. Ramona would never cheat on me. Would she? No, I, I can't believe it. Not especially after spending such an, a great night together. As he stood at the window, fighting the jealousy, the country boy said something causing Ramona to squeal in delight. She placed both her hands on his and gave an emphatic, giggly nod. Benjamin's jealousy morphed into heartbroken anger. He turned from the window and stormed off down the sidewalk. Lines from the song skittered through his mind. Uh-huh, baby, where you stayed last night, you got your hair all tangled and you ain't talking right. His mind was filled with jealousy, anger, and hurt, pushing aside all rational thought. It did not matter that she had been with him the past few nights. People who cheat were very adept at sneaking around in adulterous rendezvous. And if she get unruly and thinks she don't want to do, take my thirty-two twenty now and cut her half in two. As he walked, he began to realize that he wanted, no, he needed, to play his new guitar. Often when he was upset or stressed, he would pick up one of his guitars and the cares of the world would melt away. He felt this would be the only way to clear his head and gain clarity and figure out how to confront Ramona, that cheating bitch. That doesn't sound like me, he thought. I always navigate the hurdles in life with a sense of calm and willingness to understand. But I'm experiencing an anger like I've never felt. I have to get control or it will consume me. He finally made it back to his home. He let himself in and went straight for the studio. He sat in his chair and grabbed the old guitar. Again. It was curiously warm, and when he held it against his body, it seemed to snuggle closer. He intended to play something light and soothing in an effort to chase away his angst. Instead, he found himself playing the 3220 blues and singing the rage-filled lyrics, Take my 3220 and cut her half in two. Take my 3220 and cut her half in two. He finished the song, then played it again, and again, and yet again. Take my 3220, cut her half in two, cut her half in two, cut her, cut her, cut her half in two. He heard someone open the front door. He looked up and realized that it was dark. How long have I been playing? He sat the guitar aside and stepped into the dim glow of the nightlight in the hallway. He glanced over his shoulder at the guitar and caught a glimpse of a glint of dull light inside the sound hole, as if the faint glow of moonlight had touched the eye of someone looking out. Benjamin shivered. I've got to calm down. This irrational anger is making my mind wander down surreal paths. He made his way down the hall and saw Ramona setting takeout on the kitchen counter. She was wearing a tight-fitting black skirt, a white blouse seductively unbuttoned, and a twinkle in her eyes. Ramona, what are you doing here? Ramona turned and gave him a wide smile. I thought I'd treat us to a nice dinner. I brought your favorite, Mongolian chicken from the Happy Kaiju. 
I have something I want to... Where have you been today? He asked, cutting her off in mid-sentence. She gave him a concerned look. I'm not sure why your tone carries some unspoken accusation. The dark lyric whispered into his ear. Ah, oh, baby, where you stayed last night. You got your hair all tangled and you ain't talking right. Just tell me where you've been today. Are you accusing me of something? She asked. His anger spiked at her resistance to answer him. And if she get unruly and thinks she don't want to do. Just tell me, Ramona, he said. Now. She gave a confused yet derisive laugh. Huh. I was going to, but not now. No, I will not tell you where I was. This isn't like you, Ben. What's going on here? Are you cheating on me? How dare you ask me that question? And if she gets unruly and thinks she don't want to do, take my 3220. Are you cheating on me? He asked, his anger now on the verge of a white-hot rage. Ramona snatched up her keys. I'm not doing this, she said. Where are you going? He asked. Take my 3220 now. Cut her half in two. Ramona stood, confusion and anger fighting for dominance on her face. I'm leaving. Now cut her half in two. Benjamin heard himself release a rage-filled yell. He stepped over to the counter and grabbed from the wooden block containing a set of knives a large cleaver with a wickedly sharp blade. He felt his rage propel him toward Ramona, and he slammed the cleaver into her neck. Ramona screamed and tried to run, but she was in shock and losing blood fast. She fell against the counter, went down on hands and knees, and tried to crawl away. She screamed, but only a bloody gurgle spilled from her lips. Benjamin brought the cleaver down again and again and again. As he did, he heard himself singing aloud, And all the doctors in Nevermore sure can't help her none. And all the doctors in Nevermore can't help her none. And all the doctors in Nevermore can't help her her none. When he finished, he turned from the slaughter he had wrought and walked slowly down the gloomy hallway. He grabbed the guitar with bloody hands and took it into his bedroom. He sat on the bed, covered in Ramona's blood, and cried as he played a black tune full of regret. When he finished, he set the guitar in a corner of the room and lay down on the bed, smearing the sheets crimson, and he fell asleep. Just after midnight, he was pulled from a nightmare where he stood at the center of a crossroads that ran through the middle of a vast cornfield. The moon hung red above him in the night sky. A giant black hellhound with saber-toothed fangs stood over him, casting judgment on him with fierce eyes. Just as he felt himself fall from the nightmare realm, the dog opened its mouth and growled, Guilty. Benjamin pushed himself up in the bed, heart slamming against his rib cage, and he tried to forget the dream, the judgment that had been passed by the massive beast. He caught movement from the corner of the room where he had set the guitar. A pale beam of ephemeral moonlight shone through the window and fell onto the guitar. Benjamin heard a ticking, as if sharp claws were tapping against wood. Then, again, he saw the gleam coming from the dark sound hole of the guitar, as if the moonlight had touched the eyes of some beast within. To his horror, he saw three black fingers poke from the sound hole and begin to feel their way around the opening. The fingers were tipped with long, ragged nails that began to scrape away at the wood, leaving more of the claw marks that already marred the guitar. Three more fingers wriggled their way through the opening, and they plucked at the strings, snapping each one with a raspy twang. 
The strings fell away from the guitar, and a face appeared in the dark opening. All Benjamin could see was one glaring eye and part of a grinning mouth full of yellowed teeth. The fingers clawed at the wood as the face pushed against the opening. Benjamin wanted to jump from the bed and run away from this place, but his heart slammed so fast he couldn't catch his breath. He was numb, his legs weak. He was unable to move his head to the left or to the right. He realized he was being compelled to bear witness to what was happening with the guitar. The face pushed against the opening and the eye bulged out, followed slowly by an ear, the nose, and finally the whole face had slithered out. Benjamin realized with wide-eyed terror that the face was that of Robert Johnson. He watched as his long arms reached out and he dug his claws into the wood floor, giving him leverage to pull the rest of his body from inside the guitar. Benjamin knew that what he witnessed defied reality, went against the laws of physics, and should not have been able to be done. Yet he watched as Robert Johnson pulled his body through the opening as if he were a snake, all the while both his gimlet eyes fixed firmly on Benjamin's. When he was finally free of the guitar, he stood and crept over to the bed. He was hanging tree tall and machete blade thin. He wore a white shirt and gray suit pants singed black in places as if he had just walked through a place of fire. His pants were held up by moldy suspenders. He leaned over Benjamin and croaked, You done gone and played that guitar with the blood of the innocent on your hands. Now it be time to get what you deserve. Benjamin's mind reeled as he looked up at Robert Johnson. He muttered through a cotton-dry mouth, what, what do you mean? She cheated on me. Robert Johnson looked down and his lips pulled back into an impossibly wide smile. His thick yellow teeth gleamed with hungry drool. He let out a crypt hollow laugh. <laughs> that girl be no cheat, he said. She was gone and love you till the end of time. What you done saw today was her speaking to a rich music man who done signed her to a recording deal. She was gone and asked you to marry her and go on the road making music together. That woman loved you with everything she was, but you been hearing the death song, and when you let your jealousy loose, you also let the death song speak its power over you. And now you done gone and killed her good. And you played my guitar with innocent blood on your hands. Now you done gone that, you gots to pay the price. Robert wrapped his fingers with their long dirty nails around his forearm and drug him from the bed. Benjamin's face was smeared with tears at what he had done to his Ramona. He couldn't resist, though he tried. His body simply would not respond. Robert pulled him along toward the corner of the room, toward the guitar. Not every man who ever owned that guitar could keep the death song from making him kill crazy. It take a strong man to resist that death song, and a strong man you ain't. They made it to the guitar, and Robert bent down and put his right foot inside the sound hole and began working the rest of his body inside the guitar. He twisted around as his torso squeezed through so that he could keep eye contact with Benjamin. He worked his way backward into the guitar and began pulling Benjamin's arm through. How, how am I, how am I going to go? How am I going to fit through there? Benjamin thought, his mind reeling. Then, as his shoulder neared the opening, he felt as if every molecule in his body suddenly changed, making him malleable. There was no pain, only an intense coldness that swept through him. When Robert pulled Benjamin's head through the opening, 
Benjamin was amazed to see that the interior of the guitar was vast, as if he were being pulled out of the dimension where grace was extended to one where grace was absent. That thought broke his mind. The last thing he was able to comprehend before his mind snapped was that this terrible dimension was filled with writhing masses of moaning souls filled with despair. One month later, on a sunny spring day, Reggie Lincoln walked into the beautifully restored craftsman-style home with an estate sale flyer in his hand. A dozen people milled around in various rooms, looking at the furniture, decorations, and whatnots. A curvy brunette sauntered over. Hello, she purred. She let her cat-green eyes fondle him, making him slightly uncomfortable. I'm Megan. Are you looking for anything special? Reggie wasn't sure if she were coming on to him or not. Um, well, I was wondering if you had any music equipment here. I understand the man who lived here before was a musician. Megan flashed a smile of the kind that mesmerized, like a cat would flash a mouse before she pounced. Oh, he was. A very good one at that. Benjamin James was his name. And I think he has an old guitar back here that has some major mojo. If you're man enough to handle it. Mm -hmm. 